I will open the floor to questions if anyone has any for any of our panel. We've uh, some time. I think we're at uh, 25 to 6, so we have a little bit of time if there are any questions. Yeah. Do you want to try it without the microphone and we'll, we'll see how we go? You know what, we'll go, we'll go with the microphone. <laughs> I'm also interested in RPL being an educative experience. I'm interested in furthering that concept, in deepening that concept to what Maudsley terms as meta-learning, that is increasingly aware of and in control of our assumptions, beliefs and learned habits around learning and learner identity. How does it, going through the process, impact how I feel about myself as a learner? Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, th th there was a certain amount of procedural learning, how to, uh, using basic skills needed to prepare an assignment according to the criteria, uh, word processing, that type of thing, Le learning to to, to respond to, to the demands, but you, you're you're asking about uh, learning at at a, at, a more, at a deeper at a deeper level and learning about my becoming aware of myself, my own learner identity, almost met, metacognitive. Uh, how do how how did I succeed well in the past? What 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 are the, what are the best the conditions? That I, in which I, 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 I succeed best. And also sometimes we have assumptions around the way the informal pathway is less somehow than institutional learning. And we have those assumptions about our own journey. And sometimes we're confronted with those assumptions when we go through the RPL process. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I won't dr drag out the response, but uh, I think a lot of the learning that happened as the candidates, the soldiers in this case, the soldiers reflected on their military experience. They were trying to, they were making a claim for a civilian award, a generic civilian award, awards like team building, teamwork, uh, leadership, word processing, uh, logistics, that type of thing. So, but a lot of the learning that that, 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 that they were gaining in, 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 in the process was not the learning that was required in the learning outcomes. It, it was other learning, which would, of course, be educative for them going, 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 going onwards. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one for Phil. Um, when you were looking at those assumptions and values and beliefs, Phil, did you look at what maybe helped to shift them if they were perhaps kind of narrow or restrictive? I honestly just asked the question yeah. in, in an interview situation. So, like, you don't know what someone's going to say. But an interview is purposeful when it's for research purposes. So although it's an open conversation and it could go anywhere, you are after asking, and I kept my questions really simple. What values would you consider are important? What beliefs and what assumptions? I, they had to be really tight, straight questions. And just listen to what the person is going to say. Do your best to listen while engaging with them in a converse, reasonably conversational way. I hope I'm answering. Yeah. Like, and you have to be open to what's to come. And then, then comes your coding. You go home, you write a memo. How did that go? You, you capture the occurrence and what struck you about it and what was interesting. And then maybe the next day or the next opportunity, a bit of transcription, you open up the codes and you break down the component parts to see. And later you might try and make meaning of it. But if... It, it is like if you're going down through ground material, you, you shred it asunder first and um, while memoing because you're trying to capture the essence of what occurred and 
stuff in there that might surprise you. I, I, have, I, have I answered your question, Grace? And, and if you were to try to, like if, if people had like narrow assumptions or, or, you know, the opposite of what you've said are the ones That's that the game, would though. underpin yeah. a, a solid process. Yeah. Is, you, did, you, they, did they shift them or, or what might have made them Not shift? necessarily. No. Like they were good enough to share with me and I'll take them on the chin. It's, it, it comes down to that. How we interpret it later, of course, our bias and our own, like, I'm into it. I'm into RPL and, like, it, the bias is present, of course, and you must acknowledge that. But then you must really carefully interpret what's in front of you. You won't change someone's mind. Yeah. You know, you'd be glad they gave you the interview. Do you know? So thanks. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Colleagues, last chance. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Apologies, I don't remember the name of the lady in the middle who was speaking about uh, Irish farmers. <laughs> Sorry? Caroline. Caroline. No. <laughs> it's have been a long day, a lot of new information, and all these have started melting together in my head, and surrealistic um, connections have appeared. My previous session was in the first room where the Canadian ingenious people were talking about their prior learning assessment experience and they had a question about that. It was very uncomfortable for them to speak about themselves in academic way in that length and depth. It was like culturally very strange for them and traumatizing. And um, also, I, I have this cultural um, cliche in my head about Irish farmer who is a merry fellow with the clip tongue, dancing and singing and making you look like a fool in the process. <laughs> but how would you feel about um, assessing this merry farmer's dancing and singing uh, their um, animal husbandry and farming experience, and in the process also crediting his uh, ability to carry the cultural heritage. Okay, um, thank you for the question. Um, I suppose um, we're in a fortunate position actually in Ireland with that, the legislation and the policy that came in in 1983. It has resulted in a high majority of our farmers now I am, have a qualification in place. So they hold what we call a level six qualification or higher. So now we would have a lot of farmers that are in their 60s and 70s who took on that training, you know, in their 20s. So they actually, I suppose it was quite, um, it was quite a good policy with a long-term benefit because now we have, um, you know, we 40 years of what we call trained farmer status. Um, so that's a particular cohort, but there's still, you know, we we'll still get queries from people maybe that have um, a farm, maybe grew up on a farm, went away from the farm for different reasons, went to England, went to London, you know, working, and then circumstances have changed and they come back. Um, the core element, I suppose, ultimately, is that the award standard is what we have in place in terms of, of what they have to meet. Um, some farmers have different experiences. Um, some might have went and did a craft certificate, maybe in Block Lane, one example I have. And that particular person, um, when, we, when we went through all his information, he did what they call a toolbox talk every morning on the building site. So it's a health and safety talk. They do it while they're standing up. They're at round tables. It's very informal, but it's saying, well, right, you know what, you have to look at on the site today. He had full responsibility for that. So what we were able to say, well, right, that is fantastic. So now there's a set of skills there, his communications level five skills, and we could just implant that. We needed obviously the evidence, a testimony from an employer. Um, so, um, you know, for those sort of people, for my colleagues, what I liken it to, it's, it's sort of like the back of a woven sheet. It looks really, really messy and strings and everything pulling out. But when all the pieces come together, you get this magnificent uh, masterpiece and, you know, that's, that's their component award or that's, you know, so, um, but I do think 
we need to be realistic with learners and we sort of have a process where we interview them, we do chat to them, we mentor them. For some, the process you know, of RPL is seamless. For others, it can take quite a long period of time. And for others, f despite a lot of support and a lot of interventions, just they may not achieve everything they thought it is. So, you know, that point that I put up on the slide, um, I suppose we, we have to manage expectations within limited resources as well. Just hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Thanks, Carmel. And another question? A question for Susan. Um, it sort of goes across. And what sort of lessons do you think we can draw into other parallels? You talk about working with indigenous communities and colonisation, and you talked about like members of the indigenous community. I would have grown up in an area incredibly marginalised, and they would not be very comfortable talking to people. And they would have had often, you know, I, I learned about rural Ireland and Peg Sayers, which had as much resonance for a fellow from North, Dublin's north inner city. You know, so we talk about colonisation, middle class colonised, uh, you know, working class education. You know, we talked about, I, I, I had a teacher who taught us Irish, and he was saying, and you remember when you'd be out in the bog? I go, out in the bog? Where would I be out in the bog? And I mean, I know he didn't mean it that way, but people, because by and large, the people who taught us were the products, successful products of an education system. So what can we draw? for other marginalised communities, I suppose, Susan. I think I missed part of that. Um, Grace, do you mind? Like, will I translate the north inner city ease? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best, Tom. Uh, I'm a Tala girl, I'm south side, so I'll, I'll, give, it, I'll, give, it, I'll give it a whirl. Um, I think what Tom is saying is that maybe his experience growing up in maybe a marginalised community in the inner city in Dublin where maybe he felt that the, the curriculum and the experience of education was a very, like, a, a middle rural, a middle class rural experience because that's who the teachers were and they, that was the people designing the system. And so it kind of, I guess he, he the experience of the First Nations, he, it, it resonates with you. Yeah. And what can we draw maybe from that experience in other contexts and, and places? Thank you. Um, that is such an insightful question because so much of what we've learned working with decolonization has benefited all students that we're working with. And what we've drawn from this is a grounding and understanding. We haven't really seen the students. We've made them jump through our hoops and we've made them hoops what we needed them to be. And so by going out into indigenous communities and asking them what is learning, how do you surface that learning, how do you reflect on it, how do you want to share that learning back, and how even right to the point, and, and I know this is radical, we're working with the communities on how to assess that learning. And because there's nobody here from, none of my bosses are here, I can say I hope like heck that they're going to support me in this, but they don't always, I have to fight hard. And so what we're learning in the decolonization is that this is all around us. Um, there was this awful phrase that my predecessor used, um, PLAR advantaged those that were already advantaged. And so PLAR was really easy for those people that already had confidence, already had an understanding of their skills and their learning and their abilities. But what about all those other people that don't have that understanding, that don't have that confidence, that don't have that agency? So what we're learning with the indigenous peoples and what's benefiting all students is it's us now jumping through. What do, what do they need to um, reflect on their learning, to share their learning, to have it assessed? And I know that's radical. Um, but we're still doing it. Did that answer your question, Tom? Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Tom. Any questions before we finish? We're just at the close. Has anyone any energy left? Squeeze another question out. It's been a long day. We've worked very hard. So I think we will draw the session to a close there. A big round of applause for yourselves for hanging in and for our speakers here this afternoon.